Welcome, welcome to 561 Music. My name's Ben. And I'm Hector. How are you, Hector? I'm doing good, man. I'm doing good. We finally got rid of, uh, or finally got past that crazy week from last week with the uh, whole St. Patrick's festivities. Yeah. That was brutal. We <laughs> always worked super hard on, on that week. But <sighs> that you know what? Brutal. Like, um, it, I enjoy it. I got to tell oh, you. Oh, no, no. I, I loved every minute of it. It was, it wasn't, it wasn't the fact that we played what seemed like every waking moment. It was, <laughs> it was that, uh, uh, it was all the in between moments that yeah. I still had other stuff. You know, I moved and uh, and uh, and I had some art projects going on, and I had yeah. some other stuff. It was just brutal. It was just no, it was a, there was a couple of days. That I think Thursday morning I woke up and I didn't go to bed till Saturday night. Not to mention the day before <laughs> all of this traveling around and playing started, my car broke down. Yes, unbelievable. Yes, so we did it all in your car. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was it was a crazy week, man. It was yeah, a crazy week, but but we got through it. Absolutely. And so we're working <laughs> now. The the big goal in sight is this festival we're putting on isn't it yes we now can focus on the festival uh the festival is a week from this saturday yeah so yeah man i'm excited absolutely who've we got on the festival then we have got spread the dub sierra lane sons of a tradesman no name sky band bryce allen band victoria lee joey caldereo bfd the shake jake walden band sandman sleeps fall victim Jacob Tacos, Josh Miles, Dominic Delaney, Ben Childs, Alyssa Kuhn, Fox Maple, and Paper Carcass. All locals and all amazing, amazing uh, artists. So, yeah, man. Yeah, man. And, you know, we've, we've been putting a lot of work into this. And um, big up Danielle, who's been helping us on the social media, too. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, it's, it's something that we kind of had the idea for it about halfway through the year, didn't we? And then it was like, yeah. it, and all of a sudden, now it's here and we're doing it. Yeah. So, you know, cross so fingers. Yeah, I mean, I had a little panic moment, you know, about a week ago, and I was starting <laughs> to think, like, oh, crap, am I going to regret this? Was this the dumbest thing we've ever done? But uh, <laughs> but I'm hoping that everyone uh, within earshot of our voice will buy a ticket, will come to the show, will help support these local bands, and will make me not regret that we did this. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's going to be no, great. It is going to be amazing. It is going to be amazing. In the words of uh, Wayne's World, to if you book them, they will come. They will come. <laughs> so, yeah, so for those of you guys listening, if you have not gotten your ticket, 561musicfestival.com, you can get your tickets there. Um, there is a uh, $10 fee uh, to get in. Uh, that is their general admission. We have a little kind of a VIP ticket, if you will, which is basically uh, a ticket and a shirt for $25. So you can save a couple of bucks because the shirts will be $25 if you buy them at the show. And, of course, $10 to get in. So you'll save about 10 bucks if you buy it, if you pre-buy yeah. it. Um, so And you showed me the artwork for the T-shirts, and they, they look real cool. So Yeah, you know. yeah, they're, they're, they're uh, distressed and kind of vintage-looking and stuff. So I think they'll be cool. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. And I think, you know, it's just a nice thing to have from a little bit of history of the of the music scene of South Florida. You absolutely. Know, I, I'm definitely going to be holding on to, you know, I'm going to grab one and hold on to that. Absolutely. I love those kind of shirts. I've still got tons of them from back in the day, oh, you yeah. know, little things oh, yeah. I did. And I just keep them in my wardrobe and it's like a nice, you know, memorial. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, hopefully we're going to have some good weather. And uh, yeah, man, everybody needs to get their tickets. Get their tickets. Get your tickets up front, actually. Get your tickets before you get there. Um, one, save yourself some time at the door. And two, um, we are doing cash only at the door. So save yourself the hassle of having to deal with the ATM machine and all that crap when you get there. So Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, please come because, uh, <laughs> you know, we've been putting this thing on. It's going to be amazing. We've all been working really hard to do it. And uh the only thing that we need now is a bunch of people to come and make it a blast. So yeah. uh, we'll see you there. And, and shout out to uh, and shout out to Dave from uh, Matthews Brewing for uh, for helping us along the way here and get this you know get this all squared away and everything. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. He was very informative. We had a meeting with him last week, and yep. he kind of helped us uh, you know cross the T's and dot the I's. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So awesome. we are blessed today i'm so lucky to have dave the beast spitz come and talk to us how's it going dave all right thanks uh, thanks so much Hell for yeah. having me guys oh yeah, <laughs> yeah it's great to be here and and uh you know tell some stories and answer some questions and talk about the new project and yeah man you know just get into some rock and roll and some metal yeah. man it's great to be here i love everybody well, we had uh patrick johansson here last week and he he said nothing but great things about you so i'm gonna do the same <laughs> thing about him yeah. patrick and i are, are metal brothers yeah, yeah. Uh, we've been we've been that way for 14 15 years down here awesome we've had a couple of different uh, band projects together we absolutely love playing with each other and yeah. we always will and uh you know we'll, we'll talk about that for sure yeah i, I love patrick uh, he said he might even stop by i haven't heard from him but he might just walk in he might, into, he might be i, I wouldn't straight in into him, the yeah. camera so that'd be, amazing. That'd that'd be, be amazing. cool absolutely if not we'll, we'll still say nice things so, so for the uninitiated um dave has been in just some of the 
seminal acts. Um, let's start with the most obvious one, Black Sabbath. I mean, he's, Dave was in Black Sabbath from 85 to 87. <laughs> um, Great White, uh, White Lion, um, uh, Band of Maricade from New York, Slam Nation, Somnia, Purple Heart, Cooney, Deep Set, then a, 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 tri a tribute down here called War Pigs, mm -hmm. Prophets of Doom. And now he's working on um, a project called uh, United Metal Coalition. It's a brand new project. Right. And that's why he's here promoting. So we're going to be asking him a lot about that. But, um, you know, it, we would be remiss if we didn't um, just explore some of your illustrious metal history, I think is important to talk about. Um, but first off, uh, what I'd like to know, um, and it's something that we ask all our guests, is how did you find yourself getting into music in the first place? What was the beginnings? Uh, uh, interesting question. I have no problem with that. Uh, I come from a musical family, not necessarily musicians, but, um, you know, music lovers. You know, right. both my, my mom and dad, Irene and George, rest their souls. Yeah. They're not with us anymore. Um, were music people. Actually, my mother, she did play a little piano. They, they kind of forced her when she was young, so right. that doesn't really count. But yeah. my dad was a music fanatic. He was a jazz, Sinatra, and a big right. band fanatic. So nice. probably f from when I was in my mom's womb, uh, there was music, you know, in the, in the blood, in the house, yeah. you know, constantly. And, and a funny story, my f people, you know, because... People used to ask my father when they would meet him because he would come to some of the shows, you know, and, you know, he was all excited. You know, he had a good time because he loved music. And they would ask him, George, you know, you know, did you ever play music? I didn't play anything but the phonograph. You know, <laughs> he, he never played any instrument. So I, I maybe got it down the hereditary line, but it started very early. Uh, I think I started playing clarinet in like first or second grade. Okay. And I was a soloist, you know, pretty quickly. I, I was blessed right with a lot of just kind of natural a music ability, yeah, and I had classical training in those early formative years. Okay, you did, you know, right? Yeah, in the be in the very beginning, and then, yeah. I, you know, I was kind of a brainy kid. I skipped second grade, right? You know, not tooting my own horn or whatever, but, you yeah. know, I ended up uh, hanging out with this other guy, Matthew Curtis. They used to call him Posh, right? And then his family moved away, right? So I started hanging out with. Uh, you know, some of the other, like, crazier guys yeah. when I was very young. Right. You know, I was like 10 or 11 or whatever. Gotcha. You know, and I had some other people from up in the Catskill Mountains, you know, excuse me, that used to turn me on to, to music. But, you know, I started hanging out with one of my neighbors, this guy Jay Riley, and some, uh, some other friends, and they were into more heavier music, and I had some other influences from babysitters and people up in the mountains. Anyway, so I just started getting into rock and roll very young. Yeah, cool. So I kept bugging my father. I'm like, you know, I mean, I was play clarinet, but I was, like, sick of that already. I wanted to get into, you know, I wanted to play rock and roll. <laughs> yeah, I get you it. You know, so he got me, like, a, a cheap acoustic guitar. I think I took, like, three or four lessons yeah. at the local Samson Day music store and I'm like I gotta be I want to be like Jack Bruce from Cream he was yeah. really my main idol right. you know in, in, the, in the beginning and stuff so uh, among others and you know and Whistle and, and other people like that and, for sure and Chris Squire and, and a lot of varied people but Jack Bruce was really my main influence in, in the early formative days so and I kept bugging dad you know I'm like you gotta bring me a bass and eventually he brought me home some like cheap bass whatever yeah. and I basically I just taught myself you know, and then he got me a Gibson EB3, nice. you know, and then it just kind of grew from there. So, you know, I've been playing bass well over 50 years, yeah, you know, fantastic. for sure. So that's kind of how it started, you know. I had the classical training in the beginning, but then really, you know, self-taught. I played a little piano and I played a little guitar, but, yeah. you know, you know, uh, bass, bass is my thing. What was it about the bass that you think that, that drew you to it? Why do you think you um, on bass? Well, you know, some people might differ, you know, because they're into guitar players and singers or whatever. Everybody likes something else. But to me, the rock, rock and roll, you know, even before metal, but, you know, rock and roll metal, it's really about the rhythm. You know, that's yeah, what sure. sucks people in, whether they it's conscious or subconscious or they know it or don't. Yeah. You know, it's the rhythm of, of the music that, that really drove me a lot, yeah. you know. So, I mean, that's the best way I can answer that. It's really that, you know, and the bass was, you know, was holding down the fort. You know, you got to yeah. understand drums, which, you know, once you get into bass, you start learning that, you know, it's all about bass and drums, For sure. you know, being on the same, you know, mental and physical, yeah. you know, wavelength. It's really about the rhythm, you know, yeah. and, and it grows from there. The music and the riffs and, and the singing, everything, you know, obviously grows. Every, every 
instrument and member is an integral part of the song and, and the band and the and the image and everything. But I think really when you get down to it, that's what drives people is is really the rhythm, yeah. the bass and drums. Behind yeah. It. yeah, you feel it. You know, yeah. you feel yeah. it. It's physical. Yeah. you know, it makes you move. You know what I mean? It's yeah. It's just, you I, know. I love the bass, and I think you know for a lot of those reasons, and also just the fact that it's kind of like the glue. It's it's right. it's 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 rhythmical and and percussive. But also melodic, and also yes. you have to have an awareness of harmony as well. You know, you have to Absolutely. have it all to be able to play the bass. Right, it's all know? those things, and again, it's it's understanding kick and snare, and, and uh, you know the grooves, and the groove is really the main thing. The rhythm of the groove, you know, however you want to describe it, you know, and then I think the guitar and, and the vocals are essential, but that's something that's on top of really, you know, the groove. That's what really gets people going. Yeah, you know? yeah. for sure. Yeah. What was your first? Uh, band like um you know outside of kind of like high school bands where did you kind of come into oh my stuff? first rock and roll band yeah, yeah oh totally um well we used to do jamming but that wasn't really a band because i was i got pretty good pretty fast yeah so i used to play with this this guy augie stephen august and dennis zachary uh, Z- i don't know zag zagarisi or something they were like several years old now remember when you're 11 or 12 you know if you're playing with guys that are like 13 or 14, you know, 15, that's like a big difference at oh, that age. You know, most you know guys that age wouldn't even talk to kids. Yeah. But they had found out about me in the community. Cool. So I used to jam with them all the time and my, my neighbor, Jay Riley. So I, I was, you know, pretty young when yeah. the older guys would kind of get me to play. But the first band that I had was, um, I think it was middle school. I think maybe seventh or eighth grade, maybe, maybe even before ninth grade in high school. It was yeah. called Rockside. And okay. we were pretty good. We did, of course, we did Sabbath. Right. We did Alice Cooper. We yeah. did Johnny Winter. Yeah. You know, stuff like that. You know, it, we, we, I was like a heavy, you know, bass player, beast guy, you know, since the very, very early days. So Right. How did you, um, how did you uh, end up with your, your moniker, The Beast? How did that come Ah, uh, okay. Well, um, I, we had a summer house. Uh, up in White Lake, up uh, White Lake, New York, upstate New York, in the Catskills. Now I know everybody's heard of the original Woodstock, right? Yeah. Okay, so the original Woodstock stage was in Bethel, New York, in White Lake, New York. Right. Now it was called Woodstock because it was originally scheduled to be in the town of Woodstock, right. but they, you know, less than a month I think before the concert started, they were flooded. They they realized there's no way they're going to be able to host that many people, so they moved the site. Wow. To, to Bethel, New York. It was on Max Yasger's farm. It was a dairy farm. And the, the stage is like a mile and a quarter from my house. All right. from, from my house up wow. there. So, you know, <laughs> that's awesome. talking about... Um, <laughs> it's right there. Yeah. You're yeah, talking yeah. about Woodstock. So you, we were asking about... Uh, the Beast. Oh, okay, The Beast. Okay, right. So... Uh, up in up in the Catskills, I had a, a a guy that was named Steve Weiss. His nickname was Pee Wee. I don't know who nicknamed him. He was a big guy, <laughs> and they called him Pee Wee. Oh yeah, like Little John. I guess. right, right. Yeah, you yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. But anyway, he named everybody in the entire community and their parents. Everyone had a nickname. Okay. So originally, I was Piggy. The people that know me for many, many, many years will know that I was Piggy at first. <laughs> but then I grew into a beast, and he changed my name to Beast. Okay. So that, that's uh, fortunate. Yeah. Yeah. He changed me from Piggy to Beast. Way back then yeah. but the name the moniker really stuck basically because of my crazy hair right you know, i've always yeah. had crazy hair and stuff my my deep you know beast voice yeah and obviously my my aggressive style of playing gotcha you know and the ladies just and, and, you know the the lady. movie, that thing, <laughs> you know, stuff like that right but really on, yeah. it really stuck really because I'm, I'm a beast on the bass you know it's just a very aggressive unique uh, kind of style of yeah, playing. Yeah, for sure. But the name just stuck. Yeah, and everyone cool. just started calling me Beast, the Beast, and I just kept the name, and I have it on almost every album, you know, that I played on, so... That's badass. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I feel like um, some people end up with sort of with good nicknames like that, and some people don't, you know. And I was always jealous. I never got, I never got a good one. So you needed, <laughs> you needed a guy like, like you know Pee Wee to name you. That's you know why. what though? That's not one hundred percent true. Patrick Johansson calls me Ben Wildchild. So. That's right. I heard that. <laughs> That's right, Patrick. Yeah. Nicknames are cool. Like yeah. I said, they can be good or bad. Doesn't matter sometimes, you know. And if they stick, and it, 
it's just another thing that people remember you by. My yeah. wife's got a couple of nicknames for me, but they're not very good. <laughs> yeah. I thought you were going to say, Some but I can't answer them on air. Yeah, that too. <laughs> and, you know, like I said, it just stuck. And you know, people that know me, my closest uh, friends, they call me Beast. Right. Beastmaster, you know. Oh, yeah. Beastmaster, Esquire, whatever. It's different <laughs> different variations or, or forms of that. But, I like you that. Know, it's, it's stuck. Beastmaster, Esquire. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little bit yeah. of everything, yeah, right? Yeah, well, Beast, Beastmaster. The law, everything. You know, yeah. that, that just, that was a natural, you know, extension there but Esquire because yeah. you know most people know I'm an attorney I've yeah. been practicing uh, over 22 years now so right what kind of, just yeah. that the side note what kind of law do you uh, I do personal injury okay you yeah. know accidents and yeah. I do uh, different types of contract work and stuff nice, nice. Yeah. yeah my wife actually has been working all oh, got 24 years now oh. for a personal injury yeah, okay down, so you can here. relate yeah. yeah yeah what would you say that the first band was that you really taken seriously that got off the kind of got off the ground you know that was like um like a real a real act you know um well you and i you you mean hector were talking before we went on air yeah. about americade yeah the band i was in with uh gerard and, and pj demarini out of brooklyn yeah. and uh, Walt wildman woodward uh, rest his soul he died uh, quite a while ago we miss him he was the great drummer anyway i don't want to get into to too deep American stories, but that band was uh, a pretty interesting band. Yeah, like we were chatting before. Yeah, uh, we were hunting down a record deal. We try to do things a little different, you know, than than the you know tri called tri-state, you know, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, you know, area. We tried to kind of bypass the clubs and we rented theaters and used to send limos for record people to come down and see the show to you know try to get a record deal. We had already produced our own record and and stuff like that, so it never really got. Uh, you know, a huge, you know, major label record deal. Yeah. But I'd say, you know, that we got really close and we're pretty well known. You know, yeah, cool. a lot of the music is, is available now, you know, on uh, Spotify, I think. Or I forget where Gerard has it now. So if right, you want to yeah. go back and, and check that out, you know. Yeah, I found it on Spotify when yeah, I was there's, there's a lot of tunes. I didn't play at all. They did some stuff after I left. You know, when I left Americade to join White Lion, they did some other recordings with some other musicians that are pretty cool, too. But, you know, like I said, they didn't really make it big time. Yeah. But, you know, we were on the map. We were still on the map. You know, it's still out there. People can find it. So with White Lion, um, how did you... We, are, you on, and are you on the recordings of White Lion? Actually, I joined uh, after they kicked out Felix Robinson. He was a bass player for Angel. He was the first uh, bassist in, in White Lion. I don't know the whole story, whatever. But yeah, um, you know, I was telling you guys a little earlier. I had gotten a call from a, an agent friend of mine, and uh, White Lion was looking for a bass player. They were trying out people from from all over the country. I'm mean, right out 80, 80 something guys or whatever, and you know, and I went down there, and we all hit it off and had a great jam. And they were, Vito Brado was trying to screw me up, and I'm, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm battling back with him. And yeah. Mike ran up, Mike Tramp ran up and sent everybody else home, and right. uh, we got we got a guy named the Beast. So yeah, you know, go home, you know. So uh, I actually didn't record on on the first record, Fight to Survive. My picture was was on the record, right? And uh, you know, we, we were doing a bunch of demos. You know, after that, it's kind of a long story. Eventually, it did come out uh, on JVC Victor as an import. All right. You know, but that was before another long story. Originally, uh, they had a big deal with, with Electra. Yeah. And, uh, you know, a lot of the White Lion people might, might know some of those stories, but the, the record was just shelved for right. whatever st stupid reason. It used to happen know. a lot, didn't it? You know, yeah. yeah, yeah, who knows, you know, record company yeah. stuff, whatever, yeah. and uh, so I actually didn't, even though my picture was on it, I didn't play on that, but, right. you know, people know me for, from those songs, and then we, we recorded a bunch of demos and stuff, and then as things turned out, I ended up leaving White Lion, you know, to join Sabbath before they did the next record when they eventually got a deal, I think it was with Atlantic. Yeah, so I'm just, yeah. I, you know, in awe, really, that um, you were in Black Sabbath. It's quite right. incredible, really. Seriously. And, um, you know, when it, comes to, when it comes to bands, you know, it's top 10 influential bands ever. You know what I mean? Yes. It's like, it's just unbelievable. Maybe top five, you know. Yeah. Uh, and um, how was th that experience? Amazing. Yeah. Amazing, like you, I you said. You a ton of touring. Yeah, we did a lot of touring, a lot of recording, uh, a lot of good times, a lot of a lot of crazy stuff that, you know, I don't like to talk about <laughs> negative stuff, right. you know, in interviews. Some of it's kind of private, you know, between bands and management or whatever. Sure. But it, it was a dream come true for me. Like I said, the first band I was in, Rockside, we played Black Sabbath. I grew up listening to all those records. I knew every note Geezer Butler ever played. Right, yeah. You know, um, you know it was just part of my, my essence, you know. So You know, I think, I always say this about Dave Grohl, which is... that. Uh, 
the best musicians are fans first. Yes. You know what I mean? You have to really be into right. it to, to be able to take it to the place it has to get to. Yeah, yeah that's very true. And, and if, you know, if you're lucky enough or fortunate enough to, to be able to audition or, or have somebody put you forward to a band like that that was one of your idols or the band, something, you know, music that you grew up with, you know, it's just you. It's all about you. How well do you play it's not just playing it's yeah. how well do you understand you know the riffs and the music and, and like Hendrix yeah. said you know it's not even just the riffs it's the relationship between the riffs between the kick and snare between the different bass notes and stuff like that you know yeah. that's what music is really all about if you get you know really <laughs> deep into it and you, you can understand and you know get to the that deeper understanding of that and that's what happened with me when i you know jeff glicksman a producer i work with with americade he ended up doing a bunch of the demos with tony iomi which was eventually turned into the seven star record as yeah. you and i talked to earlier it was supposed to be a, a solo album anyway yeah um you know glicksman who was a producer i work with and when i had left the americade project he said you know beast one day you're going to get a call from me you know i think you're great you're cool you I like you you get along with people you know and someday the phone's going to ring and you get a call from me I'm like great and you know lo and behold lo and behold <laughs> you know that's what happened not too many years later and then they flew me out to la uh, and uh, there was a guy named richard cole you made me think of this now wow yeah. <laughs> richard cole used to be uh, uh, one of the tour managers with led zeppelin he was around in the in the main led zeppelin days and you know he was involved with you know tony naomi's project during this time what a nice guy yeah. and he the, he actually picked me up at the airport and we had a great conversation they brought me to la and I, I was I might have been I think it was the same night or the next night I can't remember, and they brought me to this really like dark studio, oh, cool. you know. And they brought me in. There was like hardly any lights and black lights and red lights, you know, whatever. And that's where I you know first met Iomi, and he's wow, you know very cool. nice, very soft spoken guy. And they plugged me in, and we just started tearing it up, man. Wow. You know, and he was looking over me. You know, he's not a you know jump up and down. He's like you know kind of you know mellow mellow guy. Iomi, sure, right? Yeah. And he kept looking over it because I'm bending the crap out of all the notes and playing right. chords and, you know, doing the beast geezer thing. I knew, you know, I don't remember what songs we were doing. I think we just started jamming after a while. Right, yeah. And he just, you know, it was just one of those click things where he's, you know, like I was saying a few minutes ago, you know, he, he's saying to himself, hey, this guy understands. Yeah. You know, he understands what Sabbath is all about. And the yeah. bass is raunchy and growly. And, yeah. you know, it's not like bing, bing. You know, I didn't never use picks. It's all fingers. Yeah. You know, and I play chords and octaves. And, you know, and of, of course, I wasn't going bananas the first time I sat down with Tony Iommi, a guy who invented heavy metal. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? You know, yeah, yeah. He, he basically, I don't think anybody's going to argue with that. Yeah, for you know, sure. Despite other people like Hendrix and Clapton and Page and pa Page and Beck, they all co contributed, you know, different aspects to metal. But Iomi created heavy metal. Him and yeah. Geezer Butler, basically, you know. So it was just one of those things where we connected. Yeah. You know? And I've heard stories. Tony and, and some other people have told me stories after I was in the band that there were other times when Geezer wasn't able to do certain things because of family obligation or whatever and they would bring in like some other English guys just to try to fill in and they all you know sat down they play with picks and I always like get this guy out of here yeah. you know these <laughs> so you know I heard some stories like that but yeah like like when you were asking it was it was a dream come true for me I was a young guy I was yeah. in my 20s you know and it was it was very exciting I imagine. I, yeah, you know, to play with people fantastic. that you grew up with listening to, like yeah. like you were saying before. You know, it, it's a blessing, really. Yeah. You know, I look back on those years as a, as a wonderful time in my life, you know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah totally. It's good memories. How did, um, so what was the experience like uh, recording the record? Oh, very interesting experience. We had Jeff Glicksman that we were talking about before. Yeah. He was producing the record. And uh, at that time, it was supposed to be, Iomi's solo album and the original idea was that each track was going to feature another world famous you know metal singer right it was going to be Ozzy Dio you know Glenn Hughes uh, Halford you know a bunch of other people yeah. One, you know each guy on a different song that was originally how it was so when we recorded the basic tracks just for that album just guitar bass and drums we had no idea who was going to be singing you know really there were no lyrics at the time it was just 
basic structure of of the songs and the riffs and and the changes, you know, and the arrangements and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Which is very interesting because it's yeah. you know kind of a weird way to do a record. You know, you you want to know where the singing is. You sure, know? scratch so, tracks and stuff yeah. with all the vocals and everything. Exactly. But, yeah. So it was not done that way. Wow. Right. It was not, and they, there were some changes that yeah, were made. Yeah. You know, and some editing. You know, you know, uh, when eventually Glenn Hughes w- was hired to sing on the whole record. Yeah. You know, for Seven Star, but when we originally did the basic tracks. It was just you know Tony Aomi, myself, and, and Eric Singer on drums, and and Jeff Nichols. There was a little keyboard, not too much, but gotcha. You know, there was little. So it was pretty much like, you know, really raw. You know, basic tracks. I think they were killer. They were, yeah. You know, it was like really heavy. It was a different, obviously, a different kind of Sabbath album because it was sure. supposed to be a solo album. Yeah, you know, I, I wasn't super familiar with it, but I've been listening to it over the past couple of days. And yeah, it, it, it is a different album. It's a good album. Great album. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and you know, we, we caught a lot of flack when it came out. Oh, really? You know, back in 86 because people hardcore, and I understood it. Because I was a hardcore Sabbath fan myself, and yeah. I, I love Geezer to death. You yeah. know, he's a like big one to make of my a big Star Wars movie or something. It's just like hallowed ground. Hallowed ground. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. there were people out there that were like, "There's no way I'm not buying that record." You know, but as time, you know, progressed over over many years, obviously over thirty years already, you know, people love that album. They praise that album. Even Die Hard. Uh, there's obviously a few holdouts. Sure, you know, you're never going to please everybody with anything <laughs> yeah. on this yeah. planet. You know what I mean? But generally, it, it's considered you know kind of a masterpiece, really. Yeah, it was. It's different than the other Sab- Sabbath albums. I mean, there's some bluesy stuff, you know, in memory, which is about Iommi's father. Um, you know, but you got in for the kill. You yeah. got turned to stone, yep. and no stranger to love the ballad, which was the single they released. It's, it's a very interesting record. I, I'm proud of that record for sure. Yeah, it did something like. 70 odd in, in the billboard charts yeah like it, it jumped up there pretty good i don't yeah. know what the chart position was yeah but like i said even even a lot of the diehard sabbath fans they you know over the years they've really come to love that record as like a very interesting time in sabbath's history which is a long history and there's been a lot of people coming and going yeah. you know at least with that lineup you know it lasted like you know the three four years or whatever it was a very interesting time so when you were on tour um at that time were you doing the whole like back catalogue of Sabbath tunes was it you know when when you go play a gig like what what, what was the what did the set list absolutely like? absolutely right. Ben yeah. you have to yeah it's Black Sabbath yeah yeah you know you People have to play that. Iron Man <laughs> yeah. you, know, you have to play War Pigs yeah. you know and, and Bob Rules but there, even then there was a lot of albums you know f- you know, huge famous albums Bob Rules and Heaven and Hell you know and we did a, a very interesting mixture of of a lot of the classics and some of the newer classics and we did. We did a bunch of songs from the new album too, right? Yeah. You know, because obviously, you know, we were pushing the new record, sure. And uh, but it was a very interesting show. You yeah. know, we had like cool lasers and stuff. You know, for back then, lasers was like a really you know cool hip thing. Yeah, really. You know, and Iomi used to come out in the beginning out of a swirling like laser kind of time machine oh, cool. thing, and he would walk down <laughs> the ramp. You know, and all of a sudden, boom, the lights would come on, and yeah. But we, you know, we definitely did you know the classics, you know, yeah. War Pigs and and. And then we actually, you know, we changed things around during the different tours. But in one one spot, we did a couple different medleys. We changed the medley a few times, yeah. which even had like Zero the Hero in there. Right. A little bit of, da, 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 you know, really heavy geezers. And yeah, I, yeah. I had one of geezers' old pedal boards. I used to turn every pedal on on that board <laughs> in this one section. I would just hold the bass up. <laughs> you know, you yeah, reminded me of that. We are talking about the show. Yeah, but we yeah. had a couple, of, you know, a couple of cool medley things in the different tours. We would change the medley around. We had, you know, some cool riffs in there and then it would change into something else like just when you were like oh that's another great song it would change into something else yeah and like you know, give them just like a little bit of a taste like 45 seconds or a minute of something you know and then i think we used to bang right into the seven star the title track from from that medley you know yeah, towards cool. the end of the medley yeah a lot of those a lot of those shows are on youtube yeah if, if you go on youtube and you just search you know, Black Sabbath, you know, live shows or 1986 or 87. You know, you can watch full shows. There's quite a few of them up there. Oh, sick. Okay, yeah. yeah. Well, I can't even imagine, though, like, I'm sitting here thinking, you know, the Black Sabbath catalog is just so ridiculously yes. expansive. Yes. Um, you know, and then and then you guys are doing a, a two-hour show, you know, like, to sit there and handpick, like, well, we're going to play this.
this and this. So I guess that's where some of the medleys, like you said, came right. in, where you can at least give them like all these little snippets of Right, because there's songs, so many yeah. songs. It's just, it's just an unbelievable amount of songs. Yeah, you know? yeah. yeah it's yeah. hard. It's hard when you have a uh, <clears throat> such a big catalog like that. You want to do, you know, the fan favorites. But then, you know, if you're Iomi, you're like, you know, been playing those for 20, 30 years. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's like, you know, you're kind of sick of doing them. Well, you so. want to push the new material, too. I yeah, think you that's gotta, why you I asked. push the new know, record, for that's sure. That's why I asked. I wondered whether, whether you know, at that time, um, it, the band was just kind of pleasing the fans or whether he was trying to, like, push forward into something new. Sounds like it was a bit of both. It was uh, a bit of both, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, and Iomi was very proud of it. If There's a bunch of, uh, you remember Kerrang? Yeah. You know, there's, there's some pretty in-depth interviews with, with me and Iomi uh, that are still up there on YouTube. You can find them. And even uh, articles and, and ones that Iomi did himself where he talked very highly uh, about Eric Singer and myself, you know, and, and people still watch them. You know, he... He, Iomi has kept Sabbath going through so much turmoil. You've yeah. got to give him, like, the world and the universe of credit. For sure. Because that's how much he is Sabbath. He believes in Sabbath. Nothing against Ozzy and Giza. You know, those guys are amazing. They're the original band. Love them to death. Everybody does. But, you know, you have to give Iomi credit for keeping Sabbath alive mm -hmm. through so many personnel changes. And some were better than others. You yeah. know, I'm not comparing mine to others there were other people that you know were in the band you know besides me and stuff but you know to be a part of that yeah like we were talking about what before is it's 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 you know rock and roll history absolutely you know, people will remember that you know what was the uh touring schedule like were you was it like the endless world tour type situation where you had it were you were you just constantly touring not really i right. mean we did we did a bunch of different parts of the globe um but because Glenn Hughes, as, as most Sabbath of this, you know, fans of this period know, Glenn Hughes sang on the Seven Star record, but it was a, just a difficult time in, in, in his life, and it, gotcha. didn't, it didn't really work out. He, he wasn't in the band that long after the album came out, which kind of screwed things up, you know, yeah. for, for the band at that time, yeah. you know, when you think back on it, because we had to replace him in the middle of a tour. Yeah. And uh, most people who know Sabbath history know about Ray Gillen, rest his soul. Yeah. You know, I, I basically discovered Ray Gillen. Yeah. Uh, he was playing with the Rondinelli band, you know, in New York, kind of a long story, but, um, you know, and then Iomi and Don Arden, the manager had come to me and said, you know, Obviously, things aren't working out, you know, right now. We need to find out. And I says, hey. And I guess when I think back on it, I, I was probably ballsy of me to actually say to them, I've got this guy in New York, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they came to me and they said, you know, Dave, we heard that you, ha you know, you, you know this guy in New York. And I says, yeah, I do. He's not a, a known singer or anything. But I'm telling you, this guy is unbelievable. You yeah. have to check him out. Cool. So, you know, get too long of a story there with Ray. But uh, obviously, Ray eventually got the gig and yeah. we continued touring. But business-wise, it was very difficult at the time because you had Glenn Hughes singing on the record. Right. And then you bring in another singer in the middle of a tour. So we yeah. kind of had to end this, the first part of the Seven Star Tour, you know, prematurely. Gotcha. Yeah. So um, post-Sabbath, what was what was the next thing that you, uh, you, you found yourself doing? Post-Sabbath, okay. Um, I... I after that, I you know always planned on going to law school, so I, I went back and did some some uh, graduate you know graduate work first. I thought maybe this is the time that I'm going to do it, and of course, you know I drifted right back into it. I had met another singer, this guy named Leo. Too too long of a story there as well, uh, <laughs> and we moved to L.A. and that kind of turned into um, me hooking up with Chris and Pelletieri. We didn't we didn't talk about that earlier. No, we didn't. But you may be thinking of it now. Yeah. Uh, and obviously Patrick also played with him Pelletieri, not at the right, same yeah. time as me. Yeah. You know, more, more recently. Sure. But uh, amazing guitar player, like Ingve uh, Malmsteen, kind of mm -hmm. fast. Yeah. You know, a progressive guitar player, and uh, he was looking for another bass player because um, I think it was Chuck Wright. And right. Pat Torpy was a drummer. They had done the, the, the one record, the Stay in the Line record. And then they were leaving. I think they were leaving to, to form House of Lords, if I remember correctly. Okay. And he brought in Stan Howland, amazing drummer from, from up in Cape Cod area. And because uh, Chris had known Stan from before and they needed to fill the bass spot. And, and Chris had called up Eric Singer and said, you know, what's about this guy, the Beast? And he says, you got to get it. You got to call him up. <laughs> so actually, when I was in New York, I had gone back to New York for a family thing or something, and I gotten a call from Chris and Pelletieri. And when I flew back out, I had left the other project, like, immediately, you know, and just to join up with Chris. Right. So that's how I hooked up with Chris. So after Sabbath, you know, that was the next thing besides that little project that, that was in between. 
Okay, cool. Were you, um, were you, did, did you find yourself back out on the road with this project? Uh, with, with Impelitary? Yeah. We, we were working on some new songs. We did a bunch of uh, sh- uh, shows. We didn't do any major touring. Right. We did play Japan because yeah. we were on CBS Sony in Japan. Yeah. And they had a giant festival there. Oh, cool. Over 70,000 people. And it was the 20th anniversary of CBS Sony in Japan. That's awesome. So what they did was they invited, uh, they chose one band from each of the like genres on their label. Like Billy Joel was the headliner. They had uh, Art Garfunkel, the Hooters, weird lineup. And we, <laughs> we were like the metal guys, right, you know, yeah. with the Pelletieri. And that was a very interesting uh, trip. We got to go to Japan, which I loved. It was a lot of fun. And we did a couple of, you know, warm-up shows for like radio contest winners. And there's a recording of one of those shows that's still on YouTube somewhere, which is oh, really, cool. really good. And obviously Graham Bonnet, we didn't mention, he was the singer. Yeah. You know, a world-famous singer from, from Rainbow and, and Alcatraz. Yeah. And uh, Graham's a good buddy of mine. I saw him a couple of years ago down here. So, you know, shout out to Graham if he's, you know, ever gets a chance to, to hear, the, hear our interview. But um, so we had a... You know, we played some big shows. That that was over 70,000 people in Japan. Wow. And we did a handful of the shows. And I played we, in Japan, but not to 70,000 people. Yeah, it, was, it was really something. It was I a lot of in great experience. to 70,000 Japan <laughs> is great just to go there. If It doesn't matter how many people you play. You know, if you ever have the opportunity to go there. I know Patrick's gone quite a few times. Yeah. And yeah. so is Dave Lentz. We're going to talk about those guys in a couple of minutes. But, yeah. you know, I'd love to be able to go back there. really have good memories, you know, of, of Japan. It's that's awesome. It's really a fun place. Absolutely, yeah. When I went there, um, it was. I, I don't have that many moments where I felt like a rock star. But uh, in Japan, I remember we were in Tower Records and they had like a cardboard cutout of the band. Yes, we got to stand next to yeah, the cardboard right, cutout right. of the band. Cool. That was a mega rock star moment for me. Yeah. I loved that. Yeah, I had a really good time there. And the the guy who was um, walking us around, the 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 um, I guess the promoter guy, like the yeah the artist relations guy, he. Uh, he was the same guy that dealt with Snoop Dogg. And, so, and he just treated us exactly oh, yeah? the same way. He was taking us to all these like super nice restaurants and getting us all drunk and everything. <laughs> I, I have the same memories, Ben. Yeah, I have yeah. the same memories. They bring you all these cool sushi places. Yeah. And there were so many fans at the hotel. Like every yeah. t- They knew. I don't know how they knew where we were going to be because we didn't know half the time. They would just... Let me tell you something. When, when you have guys like that, when they bring you to Japan, you are going every minute. They have you booked on the pu- the famous puppet show. Did do the puppet show? No, I didn't. really? No, I did not. Oh, everyone! I they wish know. I did. They do. They put you on this puppet show where you're 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 on this. I can't remember the whole thing. They got, <laughs> they got the puppets going on. It's like really like huge famous in Japan. Oh, that's and then awesome. me and Chris and Pelletary, they we did a bunch of uh, bass and guitar, you know, teaching clinics and stuff. Yeah, you know, and they have you going from place to place nonstop. Yeah, exactly. Stop, that right. was the main thing that I remember is like we'd get like three, four hours sleep and then they'd get you up real early. Yes. And these weird like hotels where everything's really small. I was and, just thinking <laughs> the same thing. And the toilets are just so strange. They're like right. all these buttons, you don't know what any of them do. Exactly, Ben. <laughs> that was the smallest room yeah. or hotel room I think I've ever been in. Yeah. I mean, it was tiny. Beautiful hotel, yeah. just tiny. Like you, all you do is just, just sleep there, go to the bathroom, take a shower. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and they exactly. got you, they're banging on your door, get the hell, you yeah. know, next thing, you're going here, you're going here, yeah. then we're going for lunch here. Yeah. Very exciting, fun, fun time. And that that's the way touring should be. It should be a lot of fun. You meet yeah, people. Yeah, definitely. And getting it done, you know, while you're there. You know, yeah. they definitely made the most of your time, for sure. Um, so after this, what, what what was your next project? I've got a whole list of bands, but I don't want to get them out of order. Well, so okay. After thing? Impelitary, uh, uh, Stead Howland and I stuck together. We had a couple different projects uh, together in L.A., um, let's see, first, um, after that, I had met this great Japanese player, guitar player, his name is Kuni Takauchi, okay. and I had met him, uh, through Eric Singer and some other people, he lived in LA, a Japanese guy, and we, you know, did some jamming, I think while we were still playing with Chris, you know, it was overlapping a little bit, yeah. and we, him and I, uh, Kuni and I got along famously, and I started writing a bunch of songs with Cooney. Oh, cool. You know, just him and I in his little apartment there in, 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 in California. Yeah. And I actually wrote the lyrics to, to most of the songs as well. Yeah. Which I don't usually do, usually have a singer doing that. But yeah. we had some great riffs. Well, and, this uh, plays very, very well into a question I ask all the guests, mm-hmm. which is, did do you have a writing process? Do you, do you have a way that you write when you, when you do yeah, it? Yeah, it's always different with the different people that you're with, though. I mean, yeah. that's, that's, you know... For sure. I mean, if you're in Kiss or you're in Kiss isn't a good example, but if you're in a band that you you know 
you're, you're together for 10 years or something, then I think you, you develop more of a writing process. Yeah. You know what I mean? In, in all the bands I've been, it's been different with the different people I've been involved okay. in. Yeah, makes Each sense. situation is different. Sometimes I'm just writing riffs on my own. Sometimes I'm writing with, with Cooney, the Japanese guy yeah. we were just talking about, or I'm writing with Dave Lynch, you know, my new project. You know, some bands, you know, you have somebody else that's doing the writing, and I'm just more involved in the arrangements. When it you comes know, to the lyrics, it, it, how, how did you approach that? Was it just kind of jotting down ideas and then filling it in? Like the way I do it, I mean, these days, I just, anytime I get any kind of idea, I write it into my phone. And then, you know, I just slowly build up a bunch of stuff. And then eventually I'll sit down and look at like the, the, the kind of sketches I have and start filling the gaps in. That's how Similar, I do it. but we didn't have any cell phones back then. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There was no such thing. So yeah. you'd have a, you'd have a, a pad, you know a yellow or white you know legal pad or whatever yeah. and you have you know lyrical ideas or song title ideas or whatever and i would similar you know similar like what you're saying just jot down some notes yeah. and sometimes you do a few lines together and at one time you're making me remember now where stet and i had lived in this crazy apartment house where they're like oh crazy rock people and strippers and stuff a lot of good memories from those days <laughs> and we used to hang out on the roof this is in, in LA yeah. right? in Hollywood in LA yeah, and we used man. to hang out on the, on the roof there was a jacuzzi up there and I used to have my pad up there and I would get a lot of ideas and I would have headphones I'd be listening to stuff and I would make a lot of notes I think I wrote a bunch of the, the song lyrics up on that roof in the you jacuzzi know, yeah in the jacuzzi That's or, so or awesome. you know getting the suntan you know in, in between the jacuzzi yeah. but anyway <laughs> talking about Cooney so uh, you know and Eric Singer was involved in that too okay yeah. Step, they both play drums in different tracks and stuff depending on the schedules and uh, we, we recorded quite a few songs uh, we never got our own deal it didn't kind of fizzled out but I think Cooney eventually put out that there's a uh, I'm trying to remember he had a crazy title for for the album I'm gonna check it let's uh, see. see if I can remember Fucked I mean, Up was the name of the, what he put out. It okay. just says Cooney, and that the album title, excuse our French, was just called Fucked Up. <laughs> so, That's yeah, great. That's perfect. And I haven't seen Cooney in a long time, but we, a lot of, I, I still listen to those songs. Yeah. You know, I have them on my iPod and stuff. And, you know, there's some heavy stuff, there's some lighter stuff, some ballads, and I love those songs. Where you know? are we at in the timeline? What's the, what, what year? That was like, uh, like, like 89. Okay. You know, 89, 90. And then Stead and I, we were talking about, you know, moving in progression. Then we, after that, we, Cooney thing was still kind of happening, but we were, like, looking to create a whole new thing. And Stet and I wanted to find two other guys that were, like, very animated. Stet's like, he stands up and plays drums. Anyone that's ever seen him play knows that. And uh, he's really, like, energetic, you know, type of drummer. Very, a lot of personality. Yeah. So we wanted to find two other guys, a guitar player and a singer, that, that kind of fit that, that we right. could find. So we eventually did. Uh, amazing guitar player, a guy named Chet Thompson. Yeah. Was famous uh, more as a guitar teacher around L.A. He also toured with uh, Dora, Dora yeah. Pesh and some other people. And then this amazing singer used to be in a band called White Tiger, which right. was a very big band out of New Jersey. Okay. Different than White Line, different guy, yeah. a guy named Neil Thomas. Great singer. He had the, he, my hair's pretty long now, obviously. Neil had the longest hair I've ever seen on a man <laughs> back then. I remember him. That's We're still awesome. good buddies and stuff. He lives in Jersey. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and then we, you know, that became Slam Nation. Yeah. And we, we record a whole bunch of songs, which are really good. Again, trying to get a record deal. Another, you know, stupid long story. We were like this close. Right. And it didn't happen. So then Stet and I had another band. We had a, a band called Purple Heart. Yeah. And then we used to do a side project called the Stench Patrol. <laughs> we, would, we would fly back from L.A. to the East Coast, New York and Cape Cod and Connecticut, and do just three. It was a trio yeah. with uh, Stet and I and a guy named Doug Blair, a great guitar player. And we yeah. did that. And then we had another band called Big Richard. I mean, the bands just never stop. I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm always doing something. So yeah, you know, no, I dig it, man. It's awesome. It's super creative and energetic. Yes. And, you know, it's what it's all about. Um, and then I went to law school. After, yeah. after the big, <laughs> I was back heavily back into karate. I'm yeah. a high-ranking black belt. I don't train. That's right. Yeah, I don't, I don't train that, right. that much right you, now. You was, yeah, uh, I've been into karate since I was like 12 or 13. Yeah, you know, traditional Goju-ru, one of the cool. three most traditional styles in the world. Yeah, and you studied under some major major players. You're exactly that, right. Yeah, I yeah was Chuck Merriman yeah. was my original sensei. Uh, he just died in October, right. so God rest uh, Sensei Merriman's uh, you know soul. But he was. The karate people will know this. Like karate was pretty new to the to the U.S. you know to the Olympics. I think right. he was the first you know guy that that was hired to train the the 
the Olympic team. Uh, so okay. you're going back in, into the, I think, late 60s or early 70s. But I was lucky enough to be able to train, you know, with him when I was very young. Yeah. And I was up to like, you know, right under black belt when I trained with him. And let me tell you, dojo is a karate school, right? Yeah. This was a tough dojo. Right. Most people didn't last like five, six months. Yeah. And we were like, you know, totally dedicated, like Bruce Lee, you know, crazy fanatics. We had Bruce Lee posters all over our walls, yeah. you know, back then in the 70s. So I had a, a very intense beginning and then I was in and out of it, you know, for music and metal and touring. And then when I moved to L.A. after Sabbath, I got heavily back into it more than I ever was oh, wow. out in California, out in Thousand Oaks, a little outside of L.A. And I ended up hooking up with uh, Sensei Mel Pralgo. Who, uh, who I love to this day, he's an amazing teacher. And he was originally a guy, a karate guy from New York, from some of the same Chuck Merriman, you know, the old school guys, but he was in California. And then we ended up being part of what's called the IOGKF, the uh, International Okinawan Gojuru Karate Do Federation, right. which was headed by Sensei Morio Higona. Getting a little deep now. Yeah. <laughs> well, for some of the karate people, they, they might get into this, you know, this part of our interview. Yeah, absolutely. And he, he is like the highest ranking, legitimate ranking, you know, Goju master in the world. Right. So, like, like uh, yeah. you know, Hector was saying, I've had the, you know, being fortunate to be able to train under the guys, that, the branches from the original tree oh, from yeah. Chojin Miyagi. Wow. So, now, now one of the, one of these guys, um, you know, just, just doing a little research before the show, but yeah. one, of, one of these guys, uh, you were like a, a top like teaching student or That's something. That's right. Good point. In Mel Prago's dojo out in California, this is in like '92 was the time where yeah. I was doing the first Great White record. Yeah. Right. I had got heavily gotten. I was training like four or five days a week with Sensei Prowl Girls Dojo. And, I, you know, I hadn't trained in a long time. So, you know, he took me under his wing and I became what's called Dai Senpai, which is the top student in the yeah. class. Yeah. Right. So I eventually started teaching a lot of the classes, you know, where Sensei would teach, you know, some of the really advanced stuff to the black belts. I would start the classes, do all the warm-ups, yeah. you know, and teach all the, you know, the moving basics and stuff. You know, people into karate will know what I mean. Before you get into like fancy stuff, it's really all about basics and then yeah. you start learning the katas which are the pre-arranged sure. you know moves and stuff yeah so i became dai senpai that's awesome. and i was heavily into it and that's when i got my first black belt you All know right. around that time you know 92 and then i continued on you know for many years yeah so i guess um you know that leads us um pretty well into in terms of the timeline into great white and and um so yes. what, what uh how long was Great White? You had two records, you probably, right? I did two records with Great White, yeah. Psycho City and Let It Rock. Right. The way that happened was, interesting story again, um, they all kind of blend into each other because that's just the way rock is. Hopefully, <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. you're not sitting around, people want to play with you or they call you up. Yeah. Yeah. But I had gotten a call, this is around 91, 92, 91, 92. Um, a guy named Doug Goldstein, he was actually... Uh, with us in Sabbath, he was on the road with us. He was like one of the main security guards. And he eventually became partners with Alan Niven, who rock people will know, managed Guns N' Roses, Great White, mm -hmm. and some of the really big, you know, huge acts, yeah. you know, during the early 90s, early mid-90s. And um, Tony Montana was playing bass with, with Great White at the time. And I think he had a family emergency or something, okay. you know, and they needed somebody to fill in, like, you know, immediately. Yeah. So Doug Goldstein remembered me. He called me up. He's like, Beast, we need you. We need you down here. You know, you know, come on down to the office. They And we had no iPods then either. This was like 92, whatever. Yeah. And they went down to, to the management office and he loaded me up with like 15 great white CDs. And I had to learn the whole touring show in like a day and a half. Oh, wow. Like less than two days, I think it was. And there's a lot of songs. Yeah. You know, great songs, but they're, you know, they're not like, really long songs like Sabbath, yeah. you know, they like, yeah. you know, very compact, you know, killer songs. So I had to learn that and they flew me out on a little puddle jumper, like Learjet plane and I had to take a couple planes yeah. to get to wherever the show was and they kind of just pushed me out on stage, right? <laughs> you know, and it went great. Good luck. It went great, <laughs> except for there was one spot, if I can remember this, this is a good story if I can remember it. The, the, one of the biggest hits, um, oh, I got to think of it now. You got me on the air. <laughs> dun, 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 oh, God, dun. hang on. Oh, you, you might have to edit this out so we can take <laughs> it. It was one of their biggest hits, one of the earliest videos. Let's see here. 
Rock me. Right. That's it. You found it. Okay, good. <laughs> Rock me. And it starts out with bass, right? Yeah. So the whole show's going great, and Jack's announcing me. We got this new guy, you know, just filling in, whatever. And I, you know, I'm not running around. I'm just kind of, you know, just just learn the song. Concentrating. I'm concentrating, you know. <laughs> We're on a huge, we was a, I think it was a doubleheader tour with Gray White and Tesla. Right. Great guys. So the whole, the whole show's going great, and we get up to the Rock Me, which is like the, one of the biggest hits, and it starts with bass. And Jack's like, Jack Russell's like way on the other side of the stage there, you know? And I'm starting out, and... I'm, I'm missing the, you know, I'm doing like Children of the Grave. I'm going, dun, 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 dun. and he comes, oh, and he comes running across the stage and yelling into my ear, no, Beast. It's dun, 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 dun. I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? it, was, it was an interesting, funny moment. You made me think of that. <laughs> but the rest great. of the show went great. Yeah. You know, and it's just a, like like the simplest part in the whole show. I'm like, all of a sudden, I thought it was like, you know, I'm playing Children of the Grave and stuff. Yeah. It was pretty oh, funny. <laughs> but I, we did a, I did a bunch of shows with them, and then they, you know, they called me back to do uh, the next album yeah you know which was turned out to be let it rock and and an interesting story there as well um th- you know we got along great i love those guys now there's two great whites you know that's a thing between those guys has nothing to do with me there's two different great white bands now right anyway um you know th- we got along famously and we, i wrote a, a, a few songs for each with them for oh, each right. of those two records and stuff cool. and um you know, and then the first one, the Psycho City album, you could probably pick out which ones, you know, yeah, because they're sure. they're much heavier than than Great White usually. One's like Great White meets meets uh, ACDC, you know. Anyway, do you have a like when yeah. it comes to your rig re- recording? Have you uh, do you have anything that you've consistently used through through the years, or has it kind of changed up over the years? Yeah, I basically use Ampeg SVTs. Okay, you know, and I use pretty much all ten inch speakers. Yeah, okay. you know that—that's what I use. The different eight ten, six ten, four ten, different different types of versions of the cabinets depending on the venue and stuff. Yeah, but I—I've had so many different rigs over the years. I used to use eighteen and speakers, right. which you know. They're no good for smaller places. You can't even hear what you're playing on stage, and like 20 feet away, you're blowing, you know, people's toupees off and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I've had 15s over the years, but I, I, I've, I've grav, you know, gravitated towards using all 10 inch speakers, especially the way Ampeg makes them. You know, bass players will know that in an 810, yeah. you've got two, four, six, eight, and the shelving between them. Yeah. And it's just something in the way that the cabinets are designed, that they move air. When yeah. you're on stage, you want to hear punch. I'm a very aggressive player. Yeah. I beat the crap out of the bass. I do all kinds of slaps and slams and, and playing over the neck and chords and you know all kinds of different sounds with my fingers. That's what I've developed over the many years of playing. That's, you know, that's what the beast is. It's my style. Sure. You know, there's guys that play better or fast or whatever, but they're never going to play like me. That's just my style. Sure. Yeah. And that, to me, that's what rock and roll and metal is all about. It's about developing your own style. Yes, yeah, but you know, generally yeah. it's SVTs. I have I have a bunch of vintage uh, acoustic. You know, remember the acoustic 360s and 370s. Yeah. You know those heads. I don't have the cabinets, but you know, pretty much Ampeg SVTs in right different on. different forms, different miking, you know, secret miking techniques for those as well. So, um, is, before I get on to War Pigs, is there any other uh, sort of bands I'm missing out in terms in that kind of late 90s period? Not really. Right. So with War Pigs was a um, was was a tribute that you had down here. When did you move down here? Uh, I moved to uh, to South Florida in um, August of '96. Okay. Right before I started law school. Yeah. Yeah, I moved here full time. So okay. I've been here so over you see, you were studying here. Yeah, I went to law school here in Florida. Yeah, gotcha. Um, and then, um, and then, War Pigs is a, a like a, 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 a tribute band, and um, like I guess a lot of people who are listening to this will, will have seen you guys play. But you're a pretty sort of busy tribute band down here, right? Yeah, War Pigs was pretty popular down here. I had two versions of that band. I think um, 2008, 2009, we started doing you know War Pigs, try to do a tribute thing, and yeah. you know try to make it bigger with you know. Having like somebody like me that was actually in Sabbath. I know, yeah, that's a that yeah, you get amazing like tribute band that actually has members of the band. Right, it It was pretty pretty unique that way. Yeah, you know, and we thought that would you know help it become popular, which it did. Yeah, and you know we tried to make it bigger, and and we we had some success with that, and it kind of petered out. Right, and then um, the the guitar player and and the drummer left to do some other things so i had found some other people you yeah. know and i brought in a guy named uh, les cosma we call him freight train right. amazing guitar player and steve dewey came in to play drums after marcus left 
And uh, the second version was really, really good, too. And cool. we, we played, like, a bunch of clubs down here and some bigger venues. Yeah, you cool. know, it was going pretty good. And then, you know, things fizzle out with different people. I think uh, uh, the, the guitar player was had gotten remarried. Right. And I think he moved to California. So that kind of, you know, faded out a little bit. Sure. And then Patrick and I, you can get on to the next thing from there. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah great. Pigs thing. Yeah, but um so Prophets of Doom. Prophets of Doom, okay, right. yeah. And that's the first is that the first time you played with Patrick? Well, you know what? Patrick and I we did pass over one thing. We didn't have a name. Patrick and I got to be, you know, good friends down here and we kept trying to put something together and he was very busy. You know, he was in uh I think he was still in Ingve then. You know, so he didn't right. have much free time between, you know, touring with Ingve uh, around the world and teaching and, and you it know. It never he, ceases people... to amaze me that, you yes. know, he was Ingve's drummer. It's just oh, like yeah. crazy. Oh, Patrick yeah. is sick. He's, yeah, you know, yeah. he's easily one of the greatest, you know, drummers in the world. There's no question. I have no problem saying that uh, any place, you yeah. know, that I'm in front of a microphone. Yeah. You know, as with the other guys that, you know, that I'm playing with now as well. Yeah. But, um, you know, we tried to, we actually, Patrick and I had a, a short-term project with, uh, a, a great guitar player, Johnny Hyatt, right. from from the West Coast in Florida, and uh, an, an, another singer, uh, Joey Windham down here. I right. think we did one or two shows, and and then Patrick just got too busy; it just kind of fizzled out. So I don't even know if we had a name. Right. You yeah. know, I can't remember if we did or not. Yeah. You know, Patrick maybe remember, but that was kind of short lived. And we, Patrick and I, kept trying to you know play together and yeah. it, it was just time and scheduling got in the way yeah. until we were able to do the Prophets of Doom thing. Gotcha. Yeah. And how long was Prophets of Doom? A, a couple of years. We did okay. that a couple of years. We did a bunch of shows down here. Yeah. Uh, it was Patrick uh, and, and I, uh, my great friend Tim Brown, who yeah. was also, uh, we didn't mention his name, we want to make sure we get that in there. He was the singer for all the versions of War Pigs. Right. A great, one of the closest friends of mine in the world. Yeah, He's cool. a guy from Ireland. Yeah, That right uh, me and the old guitar player, Rick Baum, we discovered him in a three-piece. He was like, like playing guitar with his head down and singing and like we stole him out of that band yeah. you know, to be the war pig singer and he's like no no you're not playing guitar you know we just want you to sing so yeah. i want to make sure we get tim brown's name in there Absolutely. so he was the singer and then and patrick and a, a great guitar player a guy named eric english who right. patrick had played with with captain nasty in yeah. a different uh, band he yeah. was in with patrick i think he mentioned that to you guys yeah, so did, yeah. i met eric through him and then we did prophets of doom we did a lot of heavy stuff it was going pretty good and then eric i think uh eric had gotten ill right so you know unfortunately i hope that uh hope he hope he's doing better yeah absolutely the the other thing which is quite interesting is um you know you brush with uh like Iron Maiden doing McBrain damage. Right. Yeah, yeah. Right. We didn't get to mention that. Nickel McBrain from Maiden is a very close friend of mine. Yeah, he just lives down the road, doesn't he? He lives down the road in, in, yeah. in Boca. And, uh, <laughs> you know, when he has some time, uh, when he's off the road with Maiden, you know, he likes to keep playing and stay in shape and, and do some rock and roll and some metal. Oh, yeah. So I've done a bunch of, you know, like kind of medium, small tours with him over the years. We haven't done it, you know, in the more recent years, but, you know, we did do it quite a few times back then. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, and actually, I'm going to, to Nico hosts. Uh, he's very much involved in a big charity event called Home Safe. Right. And he does an annual thing, you know, a big charity event, which yeah, is this right. Saturday down at the Hard Rock. Oh, it's this Saturday, really? Yeah, it's this Saturday, yeah. Okay. So I'm not playing at it. I'm just there as a guest. Yeah. You know, so it will be nice to, to participate, in, you know, at the, at the charity event. Is it an all-day thing? No, it's an evening thing. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The only reason I ask is because we got a gig, so I'm going to come back. Yeah, I right, come no, it's in the evening. Gig. All right, gotcha. Um, yeah, so I think that leads us nicely into your new project, the yes. United Metal Coalition. Tell us a little bit about that. Yes, UMC, the United Metal Coalition. Um, this is a new project that Patrick and I have been putting together for a while. And um, I'm happy to say it's, it's starting to get off the ground. It is new, yeah. but it is starting to happen. And we've got unbelievable amazing guitar player named Dave Linsk. He, he's been an overkill for a long time. Yeah. And he also did a bunch of stuff with Sebastian Bach. Yeah, wow. Uh, he was in a band, a project called Hail, another one, Speed yeah. Kill Hate. He's right. pretty much known, you know, mainly from overkill. Right, yeah. And let me tell you, I play with some of the greatest guitar players on the planet. Sure. Dave Linsk is a genius. Wow. Uh, okay. I, I have no problem saying that, just like I was praising Patrick a moment ago. Him yeah. and I just hit it off. You know, we met. Uh, we were both teaching at the Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp okay. you know, a couple of years ago. Yeah. We, we, you know, we've kind of vowed, you know, to do something together. We had a, a really interesting connection and chemistry sure. from the moment we met. And then we plugged in. 
you know, even just doing like Zeppelin and the stuff that we were doing for the fantasy camp. Yeah. We're like, we, you and I have to play together. And oh, it took yeah. a little time. You know, we had pandemic got in the way for a while. Yeah. yeah. You know, obviously it did for everybody. And uh, we've got it going. We got a bunch of songs. We did a couple of big shows. We just played uh, for the uh, Monsters of Rock cruise we did the big cruise party thing with like thousands of people there there's a bunch of videos i think you're going to show something yeah eventually. you know what let's do that right now okay and then we'll come back and we'll talk about it a little bit sounds great cool check it out This episode is brought to you by Handlebars Bar and Grill. It's a biker bar in um, Tequesta, which is just a little town right on the top of Jupiter there, just north of Jupiter. So if you're heading north um, on US-1 out of Jupiter, you will um, come across it on your right. It's a, a yellow building, um, it, and it's a biker bar, so you'll see a bunch of bikes out there. There's always bikes out front. And um, my father-in-law, Peter Pinello, he reopened the place um it has been a biker bar for a long time but it started to fall into disrepair and um uh we as a family pretty much uh, with a <laughs> bunch of help for some for, from some friendly bikers uh refurbished the place and uh reopened it and it's got great beer there now great food Burnsy does the food we do a bike night every second thursday of the month and I do an open jam on the fourth Sunday of every month. So if you are a, uh, an aspiring musician or someone who just wants to come and hang out and play some tunes, or if you want to try out any material, come down to the open jam. On, and it's actually this Sunday. So um, if anyone wants to come and jam with me on Sunday, I will be at Handlebars Bar and Grill, and you can come and check the place out. Um, awesome. Yeah. yeah. Our uh, our uh, next sponsor is Backsaver LLC and Backsaver uh, LLC uh, Chiropractic Care. Um, they are local here at West Palm Beach. Dr. Christopher White, a uh, good friend of ours, a uh, good friend of mine, good friend of the family's, um, friend of the show, um, and, and a fantastic guy who is actually sponsoring our uh, 561 Music Festival. So big ups Thank to you him very for much, that. Thank you very much, sir. But anyways, they... Uh, they uh, they specialize in uh, auto accidents, slip and fall, that sort of thing. So you know if you've had any kind of issues, um, any any uh, any back issues uh, due to personal injury or anything like that, go see Dr. Christopher White at Backsaver LLC. I promise you, they will take care of you. You will not regret it. Um, good people and good doctor. Oh yeah, and uh, our final sponsor for this episode is Oasis Root. It is a carver bar on Indian Town Road, um, Seagrove Square in. Uh, in Jupiter. Now, um, if you've never had kava before, it is a Polynesian root that they grind up and turn into a drink and um, gives you a little bit of a kind of a, a buzz, but it, it doesn't 
intoxicate you and uh, it's kind of like a little social thing you can do you know so a little bit like going to a, a coffee house or something like that and uh, it's a great place Jim who um, owns and runs the place is, is a very nice man friend of the podcast and um, he helps us do it sponsors it so thank you very much Jim and it's a cool spot I, I'm in there you know quite often so uh, if you want to uh, come and hang out with me at Oasis Fruit then you should do that <laughs> it's a cool place um, yeah they have carver and, and coffee and kratom and some different things like that and uh, they do a poker night in there and um, they you know you can play video games or do, uh, he, he pretty much always has a classic movie running in the mornings if that's your kind of thing and it's just a, a nice little community of people uh, it's like a bar, but no one's drunk, which uh, is pretty cool if you ask me. The bonus plan. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah. All right, cool. So, um, yeah, that was a great video we just watched but of you guys um, you. playing Hellbound for Leather. Um, could you uh, tell us a little bit about the members of the band? Yeah, uh, we, we we touched on a few of them. We talked. Uh, we got Patrick Johansson uh, on the drums and, and uh, amazing Dave Linsk on guitar. Yeah. And I have to mention our, our great new singer. His name is Daryl Beach. Oh, yeah. Um, he was from a band called... Um, Salty Dog, they were signed to Geffen. Right. A couple of records with them uh, back in, the, I think, you know, in the 90s, maybe a little ways back. And he was also in quite a few bands uh, in Texas. And I think he was originally from Oklahoma. Right. And uh, Dave Glinsk did some uh, writing with him before, you know, we got involved with this project. They've, they've known each other for a while. And it turns out that I know a bunch of people that, that Daryl knows, but we, didn't, we never got to meet until recently. Right. So we were actually hunting for uh, the right singer for, for this band, and uh, and Dave, you know, mentioned, let's bring down Daryl, and it's worked out great. He's amazing. You know, we're doing some covers right now. We're working on original songs. We're going to be recording uh, very, very shortly uh, on our own music. But in the meantime, we wanted to get the buzz out on the band, so we, you know, going out and doing some shows, which is some really heavy covers, like, you know, Painkiller and Hellbent for Leather and a yeah. bunch of sad. Sabbath, you know, Symptom and stuff like that, you know, a lot of cool songs. And Daryl is just kicking ass, man. The guy's a great singer. There's very few guys that can that can cop like Rob Halford. Yeah, you know, for trying sure. to do painkiller, <laughs> you know, and, and he believe me, he's he's great. And the shout out to Daryl. And yeah, it's going him. great. It's United Metal Coalition. And uh, we're just getting going. And, you know, got a few shows. We're working on talking to a couple different agents and pr promoters to try it's to get some more shows going. It's exciting that you're. I, I wasn't aware necessarily um, until I spoke to you that you know you're going to you're planning on writing music and, and really doing it. That's oh, that's, absolutely. That's exciting. The covers is fun to do. You know, uh, to to play some of the venues. Uh, you know, down here in South Florida, you got to be able to do you know some covers. And we're looking to do some bigger you know bigger venues because we got a whole show. We got yeah. a big show. We got giant. And backdrops and stage scrims, you yeah. know that that we use, you know, when you can make them smaller or bigger, you know, depending on the size of the of the venue and the stage yeah. and stuff, you know, because we use a lot of equipment when we play. Yeah. Doesn't mean that it's you know so ridiculously loud to blow people away. It's pretty loud, yeah. you know. It's 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 pretty intense. But, I couldn't um, imagine you playing quietly. No, you don't seem like a guy who plays quietly. <laughs> just, you can't. I mean, it, all, <laughs> no. it, it all starts yeah. with Patrick on the drums. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and it's all that a, a plexiglass <laughs> screen in front of it. It's not going to matter. <laughs> it, you know, it, it all starts from there. But we yeah. have a show, and we want to be able to do the whole show. Yeah. You know, so it's it's important to you know have and like we were talking uh, be, before about bands and a little off camera. You know, it's really about the chemistry. You know, the the rock and roll. It's all been done a trillion times before. You you know, yeah. and, and you know everybody can play these riffs. It's not how you do the riffs; it's the presentation, sure. it's the show, yep. it's people seeing you having fun and rocking out up there. You know, when I see a singer, I yeah. want to see the veins popping out of his skull. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, when, when you see me play, I'm just whacking the bass. I'm, you know, and, and Dave just ripping. You know, oh, yeah. I mean, that's what you don't like when you see us. You're not even sure who to watch. Yeah, you know. Yeah. You know, it's just like a fun event. People, you know, really, really digging it. And yeah. we're looking forward to doing some more shows. And, you know, there's a bunch of videos, like one of them we played, you know, yeah. that, that are on YouTube. You can just search United Metal Coalition. There's a bunch of, you know, pretty cool videos that are up there. And hopefully, you know, be some, some other ones soon. It's a cool name. It's a real, like, yeah. solid like super name? group yeah. name. Yeah. Yeah. Here's yeah. a funny yeah. story. Solid. We've been trying to come up with a name for this band yeah. for like eight months. I have so many lists. I, I can't even tell you. 
Dude, I'm in a band called No Name Ska Band because we couldn't figure out a name and we so just called it No Name Ska Band. You can relate. I'm not even, <laughs> yeah. even going to mention any of the other names. It doesn't matter. Yeah. We've had lists and lists and, and band rehearsals where we'd stop for an hour and talk about the name and we were so close a few times. Ah, oh, no, that sucks. Yeah, you know? yeah. And plus, it's really, besides just coming up with something cool and heavy and metal and original, it's almost impossible to get a dot .com yeah. you know, with that name. I mean, there was a couple of names that we, we were like almost agreed on and then they were taken or well, yeah. some guy wanted like 500 grand to buy it from him. Sure. You know, so, I mean, that's not the be all end all, but that was a big part of it for us to be able to get a dot com. So when somebody does a search for the band name, boom, you're right up there. You're on the top. You know, they're going to find you right away. So that yeah. was important to us. For sure. Killbillies, which is the band that Hector and I play in, um, the dot com is owned by a guy who made a... Uh, like a a comic, a visual comic yeah. called Killbillies, you know, about, I guess, like, the hillbillies that kill people or something. Yeah. But, um, and, and he won't sell it to us. It's a nightmare. Right. <laughs> <laughs> totally relate. It's very difficult. Yeah, yeah totally. Yeah, uh, um, yeah so a, a question that Justin reminded me that um, we have to ask because we ask everyone is, um, do you still practice when you're at home? Sure. Yeah. Not on a daily basis. Right. You know, I mean, I, I try to keep it really you know, beastly, spontaneous, Okay. you know, yeah, whatever. Yeah. But, you know, when we have a show coming up or we're working on new tunes or, uh, you know, different ideas, you know, we're, we're rehearsing, you know, we do lengthy rehearsals and stuff. We take breaks, but, you know, we're working on that and we're listening, you know, you're still listening, you know, to songs in the car and at home and stuff. Yeah. yeah and I noodle, you know, I noodle yeah. around and keep my fingers in shape and stuff. Yeah, cool. But it's not the same, you know, when I'm, once I put it, put the bass on and I'm in the room with the guys, you know, that's a whole different thing than oh, just, yeah. sure, you know, sure, niddling. Yeah. I mean, you know what I mean? I've been doing this a long time. So, yeah. you know, I, I don't sit there and practice, you know, five, six hours a day. Like, you know, back in the day, I used to do a lot more of that. Yeah. You know, more, I, I try to keep it more spontaneous, you know, and keep, keep the, the uh, articulations and, and the chops together you know i sent you a couple of pictures of, of some of the bases we were talking about before we didn't yeah. touch on that yet yeah, you want to take a look at them Let's yeah absolutely that. people might be interested I'm... you know in that we talked about uh, some of the ampegs and stuff absolutely i mean this is this is pretty much usually my main one of my main stage bases uh, this is a stuart specter ns2 a vintage model this is actually the only one of these in the world if you can look close as you see it has a whammy it's yeah. got a bar oh, yeah. in that, which I'm kind of known for, you know, d uh, using them. And that's not I, – I have some bases with Kalers. There's yeah. only pretty, you know, two companies that really made them for bass, Kaler. Okay. And I have quite a few with Kalers. This is uh, – actually was done for me uh, personally by Ned Steinberger. Wow. Uh, we're getting a little deep, but um, Ned Steinberger and Stuart Spector were partners back in the, in the 70s. Right. And then they, they eventually split up and created their own guitar companies. And I'm good friends with, with both of them, and they're both geniuses, obviously. Yeah. You know, Steinberger, you know, changed guitar in a lot of ways. But yeah. without getting too deep, the, the this is called a transposing tremolo, which right. he put on this bass for me personally because uh, he asked back in back when I was getting into you know the bar stuff and I was endorsing some of Steinberger's and Spectre's products back back early as White Lion. Right. You know I used to go to the to Spectre's factory in Brooklyn and pick out necks and you know and I used to do you know spec demos and stuff on some of his you know different guitars that he was you know building. Besides, this is the, one of his main standard shape, the NS2, right. which actually stands for uh, Ned Steinberger. Okay. You know, I think they created it together. But anyway, uh, I got in, through Stewart. I got to meet Ned Steinberger and did a bunch of stuff. I don't really use the main Steinberger basses on stage. I did a few times. They were just too small for me. They're right. just amazing instruments. But yeah. a lot of guitar guys obviously did. Yeah. And so back then when he was promoting this new, the, the whammy bar, the transposing tremolo, which the way it works is there's, there's a notch. You can use it as a whammy up and down, but it had a notch where you could actually click it into like six or seven different guitar tunings, more so for six-string guitar, uh. you know, than bass, where it was just, you know, without retuning anything, you could just be in, you know, a, a whole step, three whole steps down or whatever. Very cool. It was ingenious, ingenious. Yeah, yeah. So he needed somebody to do the, the Steinberger demonstration videotape. So he hired... Um, Rick Derringer to, did the six string and I did the bass thing. And in return, he said, you know, instead of paying me, I'll give you, you know, some instruments and yeah, stuff. Yeah, cool. So he'd give me a couple of Steinbergers. And then at that time, I was heavily into using the Spectres. Right. And I said, look, you know, you know, what I want you to do is to put a transposing tremolo on my Spectre. Yeah. And a funny story, you know, 
Uh, Steinbergers are known because they're headless, headless guitars and basses, yeah. Yeah. which I love. I have quite a few of them, <clears throat> West Tones and, and some other models. But Steinberg and Ned, he wanted to chop the headstock. <laughs> he wanted to chop the headstock off this bass. I'm like, there's no way. <laughs> yeah. you know, nothing against that. You know, I don't have a problem using the double ball strings or whatever, but you can't do it. So he compromised and he says, you know, it has a special brass nut on it. And he actually, you can't see it that closely, but if you look at the bottom of the picture, you can see the bar there. Yeah. And what he did is he cut, you know, it's a special type of, you know, installation for, for that. It's different than the Kayla tremolos. And, right. and so he actually made this one for me and that's the only only one in the world. Wow, look at that you thing. You know, a Spectre with a Steinberger Transtram. And it's just, I mean, it sounds unbelievable. Yeah. So that that's usually my main stage bass. And if you roll on to the next shot, I've been using these a long time. That's a Philip Kubicki X Factor. That's a red one, a, a fairly newer model, which kind of sat at home for a long time. I'm, I'm mainly known for using the black one. I didn't take a picture of that one, which is, you know, pretty much beastly destroyed. Right. You know, it's a, it actually kind of belongs in the hard rock now. Yeah. You know, from, from my fingers coming off the strings, you know, like you ever see like people put dents like in the wood? Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's like a half inch gouge ah. in, in the black ones. People, fans of mine have seen me use it before, but yeah. uh, in some of the recent shows I've been using this. Uh, cool. It's just an amazing bass. He worked on the space shuttle. It's all based on ergonomics. Into right. the interaction of man and machine. Oh yeah, um, I could talk about it for an hour. We don't have much time, but um, <laughs> you know, I, I switch off be, between pretty much the Specters and the Kubikis. List for this band right now, you know, and, and I, I probably have over 150 bases. Wow. You know, they completely taken over my, my house. Yeah, you know, so that's that's another story. We, I got, we were talking yeah. about it earlier. Hector yeah. brought it up that you know both of our wives are sort of worried about us because we have like you know 20 guitars or whatever. It's like it doesn't even touch the kind of level right. you've got yeah. to no, it's, it's, it's complete insanity yeah. and I think I, I took one more picture that's just one wall yeah. of, of some some crazy stuff up there yeah, you know there's a guild blade runner on the top left that's a very very rare um, a base uh, Joe Perry made it famous if you remember he did it right, he yeah. did it in the famous uh, Aerosmith video his was all black I think they only made about a hundred <clears throat> uh, guitars and a hundred bases that's very expensive then there's a flying V there's a Gibson flying V Same. and the smaller one in the top that's really rare that's a Stanley Clark Spellbinder right which um, I haven't really used on stage much it's just a very very rare instrument next to that is, is a, a BC Rich Warlock hard yeah. to tell unless you zoom in but that does have a Kaler whammy on it right and that's a I mean people have no warlocks you've seen that shape yeah, everywhere sure, yeah. but that one is quite rare because it's an, it's a neck through you know most of them were bolt-ons right but that that's a neck through and it has besides just the, the factory Kaler whammy installed that one actually has all the advanced BC rich rich bitch you know the rich bitch was yeah. a famous shape yeah. guitar yeah. has the, the rich bitch electronics in that and uh, the one next to the warlock is is a lace helix very interesting bass and, yeah. uh, and then you got a Gibson Explorer in the bottom left there. Yep. Another another one of my black Spectres with no bar on it. And then next to that is a Warwick uh, rock bass. And then I think the one next to the Warwick, the red Warwick, is a, a black DBZ, right. which I haven't really used on stage. It's a, The body's a little bit big. And, and there's a bunch of other ones on the floor that, that you can't really see. But I love those Spectres. They're real yeah, cool. Spec, it's just amazing. You know, yeah, yeah. One of the finest instruments ever made. I have Alembics and stuff, too, yeah. you know, some and some vintage Fenders and stuff. Stuff. They're not in the picture, but um, you know they, they're, they're really cool. They're some people call them like furniture. You know, they're very very expensive instruments. I don't really use them for metal. Sure, but, you know maybe someday I'll be able to pull it out and use. It. I go through different phases. Yeah, you know, depending on the band and the people I'm playing with and, and the material, you know, the repertoire that we're doing. You know, and as I get older, you know, your body changes, and yeah. you know, you can get them out when you go into your jazz period. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm, I'm into jazz. I don't really play that stuff. I mean, the, like you know, more fusion stuff, like yeah, sure. Return to Forever, you know, Chick Corea, and and you know, stuff like that. You know, yeah. I've had my phases. And I still listen to that stuff too because it just blows me away. They're just such amazing, you know, musicians. I met Stanley briefly one time. I thought my hands were pretty big, yeah. and he shook my hand. It was like. You know, his whole hand en- engulfed my arm. Man. <laughs> and he, and the, those basses that Stanley Clark plays, those Olympics, those are short scale basses. I don't know how he does it. Yeah, really. Yeah, I mean, the guy's just monstrous. But, you know, I'm, I'm into, you know, a lot of different kinds of music. So the basses I use are just really depends on the mood I'm in and, the, and the, you know, what I'm doing at the time, you know, what I'm more comfortable you sure. know, with. I have, I have some Les Paul basses, you know, I endorse them. I, when, we didn't mention Nuclear Assault, actually, before. Oh, that's true. Yeah, I toured with Nuclear Assault back in 93. 
93, 94, did a couple of fun tours with them. Sick. And I was actually using, I had an uh, endorsement deal with, with Gibson. I was using some uh, a black beauty, black Les Paul beauty. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I pulled it out because Dave, Dave Linsk has got some Les Pauls. He's using some other guitars right now, but I said, like, I got to bring that Black Beauty, you know, maybe. And it was just so heavy, man. Yeah. You know, I hadn't pulled it out of the case in like quite a few years, and it sounds great, yeah. and it looks killer. Yeah. And I was like, bro, this is just too heavy. Yeah. You know, right. it's just, you know, just, I wasn't comfortable playing Painkiller, yeah. <laughs> you know, on that. It's just too much going on. I know something that you wanted to talk about that we didn't get to is um, your interest in, you know, lo the local scene and education yes. and, and, and that kind of neck of the woods. Do you teach? I do. I do teach uh, now and then. Uh, I wish I had more students. I know Patrick is, uh, you know, really, really big on that. He has quite a few students. He's built up, you know, his student roster for a long time. Uh, I wish I could get to that point. I do teach, yeah. you know, here and there. I've done some seminars and teaching clinics uh, for certain companies right. uh, and certain music shops now and then. Once in a while, I'll do some private stuff. But, you know, I wish I had, you know, uh, a lineup of, of more uh, of steady students because, sure. you know, like we were talking about before, it's... It's, you know, none of us are going to be here forever. I want to be able to pass it on, oh, yeah. pass my knowledge on, my insight, yeah. you know, to bass playing. You've got a ton of knowledge and insight. I think yeah, you'd no be, doubt. yeah, know. and I love yeah, teaching. Yeah. I have an instructional video out that's on Hot Licks that's been out. If you search, you could, I don't know if you could buy it, but you could probably find, you know, find it on eBay and stuff. Interesting. Uh, from Arlen Roth, who was the owner when of Hot did Licks. did you do that? Oh, I did that uh, back when I was in Pelletary, like 80, 88. Oh, cool. i got to find that. That sounds yeah. interesting. It's great. It's a beginner's tape, yeah. you know. Because I had reviewed all the other tapes, Ent Whistle and Billy Sheen, a lot of guys had had other instructional tapes out, and no one had like you know a, a more for a beginner intermediate. Okay. So it's called Base Fundamentals. Oh, it's nice. a great tape, yeah. you know, for if you even you know more advanced guys. A lot of cool stuff. Even like thirty years later, you go back, you know, and I, I watch that video. It's there's a lot of cool stuff on it, you know, because like we're saying, there's an insight. You know, to to drumming, yeah. guitar playing, bass playing. You know, and you know when you get somebody like me, I've been playing a long, long time. You know, and played with some great people all over the world. A yeah. lot of different bands. Obviously, we've been talking about it for a long time tonight. A lot of different people that I've played with. You know, you you develop your own style, which is the most important thing. Like I said, it's all been done before. It's how you do it. It's the chemistry. It's the way you approach the instrument when people listen to you play on recording or especially when they see you live, you know, they want to be like you. They want to play or they, yeah. they want to learn their instrument better. And you're never going to be like me because I'm me. You yeah. want to be like you. Yeah. But, you know, you go, you go see us play and you're going to get some insight. You're going to get some, you know, see me do things that other bass players don't do because that's the way I approach the instrument. Yeah. You know, I, I, have, I do it in a very highly emotional, aggressive way. Yeah. You know, sure, I lay back. I lay back when, when it's called for in, in a certain part or a certain songs or whatever. That's your job is to lay back, you know. But there's other spots when you're doing heavier stuff yeah. that, you know, you're going bananas and I'm playing chords and octaves. And I think knowing know, knowing when to do that is a big part of, of being a bass player. Absolutely. It's that, you know, just knowing when to pop out of the box and knowing when to stay in it, you know. Right. Pick your spots. Yeah. Pick your spots. Have them worked out. doesn't have to be the same riff or same notes, you know, at each show. But, you know, we worked that out with the band. Obviously, yeah. the guitarist, Dave Linsk, he's got all his solo spots. So the solos are in the solos. Yeah. But then we, we work out spots where Patrick goes bananas and takes, you know, he has intros to songs like Painkiller and yeah. uh, and uh, Over the Mountain and stuff like, you know, some songs where there's a drum intro before the band kicks in. Yeah. Or, and he has other spots in songs that, you know, we designate, you know, there's, there's a good spot here, you know, we're laying back. And then I have my spots. And yeah. we, we change them around, too. You know, we're creating... You know, for the next show, Dave Linsk and I are going to work out like a bass guitar, uh, you know, where we battle each other kind of thing. Yeah. You know, some spot in the show. That's I like seeing that when I go see shows. Like we, sure. we try to we try to perform and put on a show uh, uh, where what we'd want to see if we mm -hmm. want to go see a band. Yeah, man. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's I think all that's you can what, do. That's what it's all about. Yeah, man. Absolutely. Rock and roll. You know, yeah. have fun. You know, do your own thing and and teaching. You know, it's important to pass that knowledge and that expertise and that the attitude. Rock and roll yeah. is the attitude, too. I want to pass that on to as many people as I can. Yeah, it's for sure. Me, too. I think it's an absolutely worthy cause. Now, the um, last thing that we do on here is we just 
ask you, have you got any shows coming up, anything in the pipes? Like what? Well, we're working on some shows right now. Um, we're, we're, we're conversing with uh, a couple of different uh, promoters and agents. We're looking for just, you know, the right one that can kind of propel us, you know, to the next level where we want to be. Yeah. Um, you know, we don't mind playing clubs, but we like playing the bigger clubs so we can use more equipment and use the, the backdrops in the stage show. Sure. You yeah. know, because we, we don't want to, you know, we don't want to appear small. We want to show people that it's it's the real thing you know it's not an ego thing no you know? i get it i, I know no, and, like we were talking about it earlier and it's really honestly um it, it's a presentation thing right. you know if you if you present as a bar band you're going to be a bar band and if you, you right. know if you, if you don't if you want to be something else you have to present as that you just you right. know it's how it yeah is. you got to yeah. look big and yeah. sound big and you know people remember that and uh that way you can garner you know more people coming out to, to the venues and hopefully make some more money yeah. you know when it's not really about the money we do it because the love of music you know i know patrick t touched uh, on this when when you were interviewing him on the last episode you know i have the same feeling everybody wants to make money you know it's expensive to to travel these days and and to move the gear around yeah. and, you know and especially in 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 our environment you know, after the pandemic and yeah. gas prices and you know it's 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 pretty tough out there right now For so sure. you got to be able to you know make some money yep. and yeah. you know we we just want to put on just a great show you know, yeah. everybody come to the show, have a great time, yeah. and say, I love that band. I want to come back and see United Metal Coalition. Where else yeah. are you guys playing? Yeah. Look me up. Go to Facebook. Look us up. I can't you wait know. to see you guys. Yeah, go to, go to YouTube. To. You know, we have a, a website that we're, you know, a .com, which we talked about. Yeah. I think we've got uh, a little bit up there. It's in progress. So, you know, that's what it's all about. And for me, it's about the people that I play with. Yeah. yeah, you know what I mean. It's really about the chemistry and the love of, of the musicians. It's always been about that. Yeah, you know, pretty much in a lot of Me the too, older man. bands we talked about. Me too. Yeah, you know, music and 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 your life they just blur to, it blurs together for me. You know, it's the same right. thing. Yes. Uh, you know, you don't want to be in a band with dicks. You know, right. <laughs> yeah, well, that's not going to work with yeah. me. Yeah. Well, we were, yeah. or, or the ego crap either. It just, yeah, it just doesn't work with me. Like we were talking about earlier, though. You know, like the the chemistry thing is a huge thing, and that translates. You know, not not just to you having fun and enjoying what you're doing, but it translates to the audience. I mean, if, if they don't see you having fun up there, they're not going to have fun at the show. I mean, that's just, that's just a fact. So yeah. Yeah, that's a fact. You know, you know, I, and I'll tell you, you know, we were just playing a show the other night um, up in uh, in Melbourne, and uh, you know, probably one of the best compliments that we've that we've gotten in the in the couple of years I've been in the band. A woman came up to us uh, in, in between sets and said. Uh, Asked us if we were all related, if we were brothers. Really? Yeah. And we yeah. said, no, that's we, cool. said, we said no. And she said, uh, she says, oh, I would, I would, could have sworn you guys were like, were like family because the way like you guys talk to each other without even talking, without speaking, you just look at each other and you know what's next, you know, and whatever. Right. And it was just, it was just knowing that she, that she could sense that chemistry yes. between us and the yeah. band was just like that was that made my night. Yeah, yeah I totally agree. It's exactly correct, and that's what. The, you want people to, to sense, yeah. you know, when, when we're on stage, we're, we're communicating, you know, physically with our instruments, uh, sonically, yeah. you know, or, or, you know, with the audio, the, with with the instruments and stuff. But you know, we're on a we're on a mental, you know, wavelength from rehearsal and, and knowing, you know, all the cues and stuff. Yeah. But you know, it can't be that serious. Rock and roll's got to be fun. Yeah. You know, you got to let loose. I never play the the song the same way twice right yeah. you know what i mean i play my parts you yeah. know and, and like we were talking before sometimes you, you, you in a certain song or a certain spot you, you have to lay back you're not going you know you're not going bananas you know doing a million notes or whatever especially on bass you got to hold down the rhythm you know what i mean but i yeah. play the way i feel at that moment yeah that man. night that crowd that you know <clears throat> that's the way that's my style you know i, I might play it this way one night or i'm going to do i'm going to play over that in, in that spot another night or i'm going to be letting something ring out and i'm going to be giving horns up to people <laughs> out. you know what i mean it's how i feel it's it's in the heart it's yeah. got to come from the heart and the, the problem is for a lot of musicians you know it doesn't matter how great you are as a player or you know riffs sitting on your couch that means nothing there's a, probably millions of people in the, around the world that can you know riff out on couch it doesn't mean how well do you play with other people how well do you relate yeah and create that chemistry with your band members yeah. and let that flow off the stage that's what people come to see yeah. you play for for that's sure what it's all about yeah yeah definitely so we've got a couple of gigs coming up we got um das on um friday the 25th we're playing there from seven to ten and then um 
And then on Saturday, we're Paddy playing Max. at Paddy Max from nine to midnight. And then I'm doing the open jam on Sunday at Handlebars yep. um, from four to seven. Um, Dave, thank you so much for coming. We really uh, appreciate absolute it. Absolute pleasure. It's been an absolute here. pleasure. Yeah. It's been an honor. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Listen, thank you so much for, for having me, inviting me to your great show. Uh, you know, it's a pleasure, you know, my, my, my honor to be here spreading the word and telling some, you know, interesting history stories. Absolutely. A lot of bands back there. For sure. You know, I think uh, people probably learned something, hopefully, you know, from this. And uh, Hector tags all the bands. He's going to be there all day. All right. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a lot of music, but, uh, you know, I'm always excited about the project and the band that I'm doing currently, obviously. For sure. It's fun to talk about, you know, the history in the old days, a lot of great stories, and, you know, they always keep flowing out, you know, at different interviews when people ask different questions, they come out. Yeah. You know, I forget about th certain things, and, oh, yeah, remember that happened, whatever. But, you know, I'm always psyched about the people that I'm playing with. I'm playing with just great people right now. Yeah. And uh, hopefully it'll turn into something you know, bigger so we can continue to play. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. we, we know, we know Patrick and, we, and, and Patrick's an so amazing, yeah, amazing uh, musician, and mu amazing guy just all around. So yes. I can only imagine that the other guys in the band are all are Absolutely. equally as amazing. So Yeah, they are. Yeah. We, we, you know, we always try to get the right people to fit. Yeah. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Like we talked about some of the other bands, sometimes it's short-lived and sometimes they last longer. You never know. Yeah. Life, life changes all the time yeah. and stuff. Yeah. But they, they you know, the, the, the guys we have now with Patrick, uh, Dave, and Daryl, you know, we have a really cool chemistry. It takes time to develop that, too. Yeah. You know, it doesn't yeah. mean we don't butt heads once in a while. <laughs> you know, that's part of it. But you got to be able to butt heads and then say, hey, I love you, bro. Yeah, you exactly. Know, let's, let's get rid of that song or you <laughs> yeah, know, let's yeah. change this around or whatever. You know, whatever it is. Yeah. You know, if you take it too personal, then it's, you're not going to make it as, as a band. It's yeah. true. You know, yeah. and people are not going to sense that, that the cool chemistry that we've been talking about. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's true. You know, and the, the guys that we got that. at the moment, like in Kilbillies, it feels like that. You know, it feels, feel, you know, feel like a band of brothers. Like you could say something dumb and, and everyone will get over it in like, you know, five minutes. Yeah. You know, you got to, yeah, you get to that point where, where, you know, it just, it goes beyond the superficial and, you know, you, yeah, you're it has to get to that point. Yeah. Otherwise, it's, to me, it's, it's, it's not going to work. It's a waste of time. Yeah. You know, time is valuable, you know, to all of us. And, you know, and especially if you're going to go on the road and you're going to be traveling together, you know, you got to be able to get along and, and you know, otherwise you're going to yeah. be killing each other. Oh, yeah, exactly. Because you're yeah. spending more time, you know, with each other uh, on the road than you are if you're married yeah. in your home life. It's, yeah, it's really. not an easy thing. Yep. Yeah. You know, especially as you get older, we get we all get set in our ways. and yeah. You know what I mean? So it's really, really ultimately important to have the right people and for, for young musicians out there you have to search you know to try to find those right people you yeah know, when you're putting a new band together it's it's not uh, that easy you have to kind of search and try to find that that right fit yeah it might no take some that. time but it's worth the extra effort to to find and it's not always the guys that's the greatest musician either yeah you know in fact i, mean, I, I want to say i want to say that it usually isn't but, you know, obviously amazing musicians are amazing musicians. But yes. in my experience, it's more important to find someone that fits, you know. Yeah, it has to be yeah. somebody that fits and you get along and you're, you're able to, you know, don't think you're so great. You know, we tell each other all the time, hey, you know, let's change that part around or beast. Maybe you shouldn't, you know, do it that way. Whatever. I have no problem with that. Yeah. You know, I might not agree with it every time or we might try, you know, a, a couple of different versions of it. You know, we do that all the time. And Dave Linsk and I, we even change some of the stuff that's underneath the solos. I'm yeah. not going to point it out. You know, you might see it if you, <laughs> you come see us play. It's for you to figure out. Yeah. But, you know, we like, we, we, we want to play that song, but, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm not real happy what's happening underneath the solo, and we, we might completely change, you know, <laughs> to make great. it ours. I mean, the rest of the song is like a famous song, Be sure. But that's how far we go in this new band. That's cool. You know, to make it really cool, and make it heavier. Hell yeah, dude. dude. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, this has been an absolute blast of an episode, yeah. and um, I hope you guys enjoy it. Who've listened to it? It's um, you know, it's rare that we get someone who's just a bona fide rock star on on the show. So thanks for coming, man. Yeah. Thanks and, so uh, much. My pleasure it. to be yeah. here. Cool. All right. Peace cool. out. Yeah. Peace out. <laughs> <laughs> Take a better scene. It's what we're doing.